It's important for all of us to know that at the end of the day, you know, if they were to choose to activate some of their sleeper cells in places like Los Angeles, because they are here, or in places like in Michigan, et cetera, then it's game over. They know that the United States, either alone or with a coalition, will go into Tehran and will be there within you know, 12 to 24 hours. This is The Rubin Report, and I'm Dave Rubin. Here's a quick reminder that The Rubin Report community is here. We've got ad-free video and audio podcast and news feed. You can communicate with me directly, as well as other fans, and much more. Oh, and it's totally troll and bot-free, believe it or not. Sign up at RubinReport.com or search The Rubin Report in the Apple App Store or on Google Play. And now more importantly, joining me today is a former CIA ops officer, a political analyst, and a national security expert, Brian Dean Wright. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. Pleasure, brother. I had you on here about four years ago. It's yeah. like 18 studios ago. Feels like 27 lives ago. Yeah. Here we are, we got a lot to do. And you've become an alt-right gay Nazi, which congratulations, very <laughs> Thank exciting. You, please. No, I'm, My I'm mother honored. Is so proud. I do wonder though, at the clan meetings, do you and your husband wear like the, the rainbow hats? You know, the rainbow. Well, they make you wear the rainbow okay. hat as a gay. Okay. Well, incredible. <laughs> great, great development for you and your family. Little did you know four years ago yeah. when we sat down that uh, so much was going to happen. Yeah, here we are. Uh, all right, I'm really glad to have you here for for many reasons. Um, before we get into Iran, before we get into the deep state, before we get into the, the split of the Democrats, the rise of the socialists and the whole thing, uh, former CIA ops, just uh, give me a little recap of what got you into it, what does that actually mean, mm -hmm. and then we'll take it away on, on current events. So uh, back in the early 2000s, just before 9-11, uh, I was interested in national security and State Department and CIA were both options. I decided that after looking at each, the CIA made the most sense for me. Uh, it was a little bit more cowboy, which coming from a farm and ranch in the western uh, part of this country, it was just, it, was, it fit me better. Uh, so I applied, uh, moved forward to the application process, took a couple of years and ended up uh, working as a, uh, what they call the clandestine service trainee program, was there for a couple of years and then sent out into the field. So what was it like being in the field as a CIA guy? You know, just after 9-11, it, uh, it was an incredibly difficult uh, and challenging time. You know, we didn't know how many more uh, threats were, were going to be actualized, you know, how many more people were going to be killed. And so it became a very, um, a, a very intense time to be in the intelligence community, but it was also thrilling. You know, at a very young age, I was 24, 25, and you're out in the field doing incredible stuff, meeting with the bad guys uh, who are good for you. Uh, and it, it was a, an incredible opportunity to know that, that what you were doing every day helped ensure that people uh, back home didn't, uh, didn't die. How do you figure out which bad guys are good for you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. Is that yeah. a question you can answer? Yeah. So there is a, there's a vetting process, right? You, you first start with what do you need to know and know a particular part of the world on a particular issue, right? So once you do that, you go through a target analysis and you figure out who has the information in that organization or that piece of knowledge that you need. And then you target that individual uh, and then you, you approach them in some capacity and then you build a relationship and you not only ensure that they are who you thought that they were to be, uh, you then make sure that they're compatible in terms of living a clandestine life with you uh, as an intelligence officer. So that is a very long process, or it can be. Um, but in those early days, we were recruiting people to be informants for us with not a lot of uh, scrutiny because we just had so little information and the threat was so profound and it was so immediate. All right, so we could do CIA 101 the, the whole time yeah. here. And for people that want that, we'll link to our, our old interview because I want, to, I want to catch up because we hadn't had you on in a while. And when we booked this, this was before this Iran World War III thing yes. happened. Oh, it's happening. Uh, well, World apparently, if you listen okay. to Rose McGowan on Twitter, <clears throat> yeah. not only that, but World War IV has also begun. Oh. There's a lot of wars coming oh, up. The, the, well, that's exactly why I wanted to, to start with this because it seems to me that if you're paying attention to social media, as it does to most things, we've ramped everything up to crazy levels beyond right. imagination. It is so hard to find sort of clear, sane, non-extremist voices in the midst of all this. I consider you one of those people. Um, so can you talk to me about 
What's going on with Iran? And uh, are we in World War III? Are we going? We are the not. And we're we not in World War no. III. All right. Oof. Well, now we have the quote for this yes. interview. Okay, All right. Good. So, to, to understand what's happening, I think you have to step back and, and ask yourself the, the question: You know, what does Iran want ultimately? Right. Um, in general, what this regime wants is both stability and survival, more than anything else. So whatever it does uh, in terms of international affairs, domestic affairs, it's all designed to make sure that the regime continues. So they have red lines. They have red lines internally in terms of how uh, far they will let the populace go in terms of demanding certain things. And then abroad, you know, they'll, they'll push as far as they can, knowing full well that the United States and, and the West and Israel, at some point, will say that's a bridge too far and they will pound the living hell out of Tehran. So they're always poking the bear. They're always challenging that red line. Mm -hmm. So it's important for all of us to know that at the end of the day, you know, if they were to choose to activate some of their sleeper cells in places like Los Angeles, because they are here, or in places like in Michigan, et cetera, then it's game over. They know that the United States, either alone or with a coalition, will go into Tehran and will be there within you know, 12 to 24 hours. Okay, so let's pause there for a moment because that was a bit of knowledge. So, so Iran basically has sleeper cells sure. in Western cities. You just said Los Angeles. We're, we're in Los Angeles, Michigan, I'm sure in European cities. So if we know these things exist, what are we doing to actually disrupt these, yeah, these well, cells? So both the, the FBI and the CIA have long known that the that Hezbollah and Iran have, have operated these, these sleeper cells. And so they've kept a pretty good pulse uh, on these folks. But the issue is, do you know about all of them, right? <clears throat> because you have to be perfect 100% of the time, and they only have to be perfect or executable once, right, to, to, to implement something horrific in the U.S. homeland. So we have a good pulse of what they're doing. Uh, and where they are, who they are, but do we know all of them? I can almost assure you that the answer is no. So, as they sort of push what that red line is, we've had a policy of what, maybe the last 10 or 15 years, of, or at least the Obama policy, we kind of let them do what they wanted to do, right? And so now Trump has kind of flipped this thing on his head. So what do you make about the strike and, and what is Trump doing here? Yeah. So the Supreme Leader never saw this attack coming. He, he had buffaloed, as I say, or my family says, a ranch in Oregon, right? They buffaloed uh, Bush and Obama. Uh, for many, many years, uh, that that we had certain red lines that we didn't want to start this World War III. So we allowed them, that is the Iranians, to do all kinds of uh, you know poor, terrible, horrific activities throughout the Middle East and indeed the world. We would we would give them enough leash uh, to attack us uh, through this Soleimani and the Quds Force and Hezbollah and whatnot. What, what so, were our red lines actually? Like, what would have been the thing that would have? change the equation on our side? Well, that's that really is the question. I don't think any of us really knew, certainly with inside the intelligence community, because uh, we had the infamous Obama red line in, in Syria that, mm -hmm. of course, you, you know, we just erased that one and moved to somewhere different. So I don't think that the Iranian leadership ever quite knew where the United States would, would the, the switch would flip other than an attack in the homeland. Certainly they learned that after the 9-11 attacks. When we immediately went into Afghanistan, we started making noise elsewhere. Uh, I think most of this is public knowledge, but the Iranian government very quietly reached out and said, look, you know, we're, we will stay on the good boy list, you know, just, just don't invade. So the upshot is that they know that we will hit a point where we say enough. And uh, I don't think that they thought Soleimani would be the, uh, in all of his shenanigans uh, would be it, but here we are. Right, so what do you make of what Trump did here? Because it's like, if you listen to the critics, it's like, oh, Trump doesn't know what he's doing, right. there's no plan for after, et cetera, et cetera, and it's, I'm starting to think, if this guy doesn't know what he's doing and he has no plans, what does that say about the experts? Because right. he keeps one up in the experts. <laughs> so what, what, what's going on here? Yeah, so I think he did it the right thing, right? So I, I have friends who work in the Special Forces community, and they were all universally thrilled at what happened. Uh, Soleimani has so much blood on, on his hands, has maimed and killed more people, not just Americans, but Iraqis and others. So the, the man earned his death. Uh, the question is, so what comes next? And I think people could rightfully and should be asking that question, right? And is this going to cause World War III? Some of that is, is hyperbole, but some of it's appropriate to at least ask. So the, the answer is no. We're not going to be going into World War III. The only thing that that would, uh, uh, would change that calculus would be whether Moscow and Beijing suddenly started moving troops into and or backed Iran, basically wanted to use them as some sort of forcing function and in this incident to create World War III. Right. Uh, I don't Meaning think they would move their troops into Iran? Precisely. I mean, something grandiose like that. Now suddenly we're looking at a very different prospect of conflict on a global level if 
Russia and China moved into to, uh, Iran, right? right? So they have a, a degree of relationship, but I'm talking about physical assets into Iran to make clear that this is the equivalent of that World War I, you know, assassination of the, of the, of the Prince in Sarajevo, right? Yeah. That people but, but keep talking to, about. But just to be clear, that, that's a pretty far, Un far off crazy thing. Although, Correct. if you're just listening to the pundits these days, it's like anything's on the table, like the right. Martians are landing and, you know. In, in the intelligence community, we talk about low, medium, and high degrees of confidence that something could happen. All right. I think that most of us would say that we have high degree of confidence that it is extraordinarily okay, unlikely okay. that Russia and China would ever get involved in this kind of conflict. One, because Russia's economy is the size of Italy. I mean, they, they, they have a lot of internal struggles themselves. And China, fundamentally, President Xi is concerned about making sure that his stability of his country remains uh, the most important priority, and then they continue to grow economically because of the number of people in that country. They need to have continued economic growth. So that is their focus and their goal, and that's why they want stability. So for them to step into this conflict and create some sort of horrific outcome like World War III, it's just extraordinarily unlikely, right? In terms of degrees of confidence, I would say we have high degree of confidence that that's not going to happen. So the question is, what will Iran do next? Right, So you're going to see, and, and folks are talking about this, absolutely a degree of pushback, whether it's from the cyber attacks, the usage of Hezbollah, they're already talking about it, that is the Iranian leadership talking about targeting you know, military uh, personnel and, and locations throughout the Middle East in particular. We expect that, the administration expected that, the Pentagon when they authorized the strike expected that. That's why you're seeing this flood of personnel, a lot of my friends going into the Middle East right now, and that is to, to make the price of any kind of retribution or any kind of attack by Iran, the price will go up dramatically. How, how do we send that message beyond bombs and killing people? Like, do we actually go on the ground and talk to contacts and say, guys, okay, you saw what we did, we know you're planning to do a couple things here and there, but you know, do we really give the hint like, well, I guess Trump sort of did it with this tweet, right? His tweet about 52 yeah. sites that we've got. I mean, is that really how it works? Like we get down there and, and talk to them about that sort of thing? Well, I, I think that the, the, the talking that was done- Like your done, house is on a list, basically. Right. <laughs> well, I think the talking that was done was a missile going into Soleimani's head, Yeah. right? And so I think the Trump administration very wisely has said, look, we have tried diplomacy with these clowns and they've continually lied to us about say their, their nuclear program. If you recall in January of 2017, Israel did an incredible operation where they went into Tehran, they, they uh, grabbed a bunch of nuclear material, that I, sh I should say, you know, documentary-based uh, material uh, from this warehouse in Tehran, they took it back to Israel, that basically showed that Iran was playing a game. They wanted to make sure that they held on to their nuclear program and the ability to move forward very, very quickly. So there's no ever real intention by the regime to give up uh, that, that nuclear capability. What do you make of sort of the set of people that think that just because you sign something, it has meaning? Like, so like the Iran nuclear deal, just any deal, the climate yeah. Paris Accord, the Paris Climate Accords, like we sign something and that inherently means that it's real. But that's really not how the world works, is it? If you have a document, an agreement, a treaty that is signed, it is only as effective as the parties uh, engaged or involved and tend to carry it forward, right? It, particularly with some degree of uh, hammer if people fall <clears throat> short. I mean, this is what we've experienced with Russia and some of the START treaties, et cetera, right? They, they were constantly cheating because they believed that the United States wouldn't respond in any kind of intense or retaliatory way, whether it be sanctions you know, beyond what we've already done to something more kinetic, right? The military is right. Mm -hmm. so, Everybody who signs any kind of document is always sitting back and, and making the calculus or asking, can we push this further? Can we do more? Can we sneak, right? North Korea with this nuclear program is a great example of doing exactly that. And it's gotten away with lying to the world and, and continue to march forward irrespective of the silly sanctions that we apply. And that's what you were talking about earlier about you just keep pushing the red line Correct. because if you know the guy on the other side right. isn't ever right. gonna push back, you right. can you can move that thing right. pretty but significantly. What I, what I think is important, and I think uh, you and I uh, have, have spoken about previously, we hear a lot right now in the media, Folks are talking about, you know, get us out of the Middle East, you know, get us out of Iran and Iraq and all these places, we, we, we shouldn't be there. And that's true, we shouldn't be there. Yeah. Why are we there, right? So, so You're let's, giving me a lot of my good libertarian side, so, right? So let's have that conversation. Yeah. So it's good that we killed Soleimani, that the government in Iran is bad, but why in the hell are we there to begin with, right? We are there because Iran and Iraq and the Middle East have oil, right? 
All these countries have oil. The global economy is built on oil. So it's great that the United States has become a next net uh, exporter of oil super. But the rest of the world continues to be net importers. Mm -hmm. So as long as these folks, uh, whether it be Iran or Iraq, either control the oil or through the Strait of Hormuz, they control the ability of that oil to get to market, we are stuck in the sandbox. Right. So if we want to change this conversation, if we want to basically make the Middle East the equivalent of what you know, happened in the 90s in Rwanda, where the Houthis and the Houthis were killing each other, if we want to let the Sunnis and the Shias slaughter each other and really the world doesn't care, then we have to remove the, 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 the impetus for us to be there in the first place. Why do we care? We have to change our energy policy. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you're angry about the fact that we're in the Middle East and we have troops there, then you have to be on board with changing our energy, energy policy. So what do you make of the argument so you can do it two ways? So the libertarian argument is just get the hell out of there. These aren't our wars. These are sectarian conflicts yeah. that have existed forever. They're going to last longer than we're ever going to exist. That's one side. But the other side is, well, you broke it, you fix it, sort of. So it's like Iraq we actually were turning it around, you know? We, we, regardless of whether you, want, you thought it was a good idea to go in or not, weapons mass destruction, the rest of it, they were having free and fair elections, basically, and then we just left. You know, we announced the date, Obama said, we're getting out on this day, we left and then it fell apart. Right. How do we negotiate that? So you have to step back and ask the question from a foreign policy perspective, why the hell are we involved in the world? Like, what is our ultimate goal? And most smart people will say that we want the world to be more democratic because the more democratic the world is, the less likely that the nations who are democracies will get involved in conflict and war, right? So this is sort of foreign policy 101. So the question is, how do you move nations from being autocratic or anything less than, than a full democracy to, to some shade or variation of a healthy democracy? You know, President Bush's idea, the neoconservative belief was we could do it via the barrel of a gun. Well, Oops, that didn't work out, no. right? Not only uh, did they view us ultimately as outsiders invading the nation, but they weren't really ready for a true commitment to democracy, which requires a degree of education of the people, right? To understand what their obligations are, right? But that's what I'm saying. If we had stayed longer, and I'm not saying we should have, but had we stayed longer once they had some elections, had we stayed longer to build some institutions and that sort of thing, yeah. it's almost like it could have worked. There were signs that it could have worked. But what is the ultimate benefit for the American people to go in a nation build in a place like Iraq or yeah. any nation, right? So we have to ask ourselves the questions, as there are hundreds and hundreds of nations around the world, many of which are not democratic, why are we going to get involved in that one? And one of the things that I actually think that President Trump uh, does correctly, perhaps in his in, you know, New York braggadocious <laughs> way, is he says, well, what are they giving us? Like, yeah. wh what do we get in exchange? And that's actually a good and important thing to ask, right? Because we, we shouldn't be going into Zimbabwe right, and, and trying to correct all the ills of Mugabe and all the, his shenanigans, right? Because what are they giving us? Nothing. We, we would invest our time and treasure into a place like Zimbabwe and we'd be getting very little to nothing in return other than a commitment to the world and to ourselves and the Zimbabwean people that we're creating a democracy there. And more democracy means less global war, right? So we have to rack and stack or prioritize where we're involved in the world. So Iraq and around the reason that we want to be there, why we give two bits about the place, uh, is because of this commitment uh, not only just to democracy, but because they have something we need. They have not just we, but the global economy. So if you were to withdraw, right, and just completely let the place go and, and be as, as it is, you, you better have a backup in terms of a global energy policy that doesn't require that stuff. Because if, if that price of oil quadruples or you know goes up by 10, 20 percent or, or, or uh, times whatever number it might be, and you start having global recessions and depressions, now we understand the cost of our inaction. Right? So there is a cost to just completely pulling out. Are you kind of surprised that Trump seems to understand all this no. in, in a weird way? No, because like, I, I have had concerns about his temperament. Um, I have. By the way, wait, we should pause yeah. for a moment and say you, you are a lifelong Democrat. Yeah, here we are. I know the feeling, my friend. <laughs> Here, here we I don't are. know what that so, means anymore. What yeah. does it even mean to well, be Democrat we'll, anymore? We'll, we'll get, get to that we'll in a sec, because yeah. you, you wrote a great piece on FoxNews.com about the split of the Democrats, and I've been screaming about this for years. But, but why do you think Trump gets this? Like, he's not a politician. He wasn't a foreign policy guy. Yeah. If you asked him five years ago to put his finger on a map, and 
who knows what he would have found? Right. I mean, what is it about him that you think understands this? Or is, is he listening to better generals than the guys before we're listening to? Like, what, what's going on here? Well, I, a couple things. How, how do we diagnose why President Trump is the way that he is and, and, and indeed that he's effective? I think we could probably have a three-hour program on that. But the upshot yeah. is, I think the American people recognize that something was important uh, in, in that man, that he could serve an important role. And that is the fact that he is, he's basically a, a walking human firecracker. Right, and he went to Washington to just blow stuff up because most of us were sick and tired of the way that Washington was working. Now we might talk about, all right, can we have him a little bit more presidential? Well, when you elect a firecracker, you're going to get what you get, right? So uh, what I think that he is doing well uh, is he's asking really important questions that, that Washington has always assumed that they've we've asked and answered. Like, well, of course we're going to be absolutely committed to NATO at all times. Mm -hmm. Well. You're Wait right. a minute. These a-holes aren't contributing to, you know, their, their dues. Uh, so what, are we going to continue to pay for that? Like, go after yourself. I mean, that's basically Trump's attitude. And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what should be happening, right? There should be nothing so sacred on the table that we can't ask a question as to, well, why are we doing it that way? So I think that that is a, a good thing uh, that the president is bringing to the table. And I think that he is bringing that, that outsider's perspective and asking really good questions that might seem to be crazy to the to the New York and Washington elite. But actually, I think most people in middle America are like, yeah, we agree with you. That makes sense. Right? Yeah. All right. So with that in mind, so Trump comes in basically as the firecracker to, you know, throw the chessboard up, the yeah. whole thing. Um, the administrative state or the deep state, or maybe you have a different phrase for it. This deep state works. This, this idea of a constant group of people that stay no matter what administration comes and goes. Can you just explain a little bit about what that actually is? Lord have mercy. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> folks uh, who get their, uh, those jobs, you are there for 20, 25, 30 years. Um, and it's true that you outlast all administrations. So what are these jobs? Like, let's really do like yeah. the most base level here, because this is the type of thing you hear deep state and everyone online, you're, you're either a conspiracy theorist yeah. or an Alex Jones guy or a, Give me something like, what are these people actually doing? All right. So when you, let's just take the CIA, right? Yeah. So someone like me who went in as an operations officer, so somebody basically goes out in the field and recruits spies and steals secrets, right? You have a tremendous amount of power, right? A, a tremendous number of tools to read people's emails, listen to people's phone calls. I mean, you can call it surveillance teams. You have a lot of power to do or accomplish the mission. And through that, some people had this mistaken belief that they are now anointed to make decisions uh, writ large in terms of foreign policy. That is, they are the ones that have the knowledge to decide what the nation should or shouldn't do on a particular issue. Instead of simply informing a policymaker to say, here's what I know to be true, here's what I think we ought to do, but here are a slew of different options and you make the choice or the call because you're a representative of the people and I am simply a tool. So basically they sort of have access to all of this information and then after years of it, you start thinking you're bigger than That's right. the, the people that are coming and going. So one of the most infamous spies, uh, Aldrich Ames, who worked for the CIA, but indeed worked for the Russians secretly, was eventually found out, it led to over 100 uh, individuals' assets being killed. When he was asked why he did it, he said, I know what's best for the nation's foreign policy and I'm gonna act on that. So that degree of hubris, mm -hmm. right? You, you go in loving your country, embracing the flag, you're there the CIA for the right reasons, but now suddenly you've come to this belief that you are anointed, that you are somehow the, the guardian of the republic beyond the, 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 the defensive nature that, that you, the people, your government has has anointed on you to actually do good things to support the Constitution and, and support policymakers. Now you think that you're actually a king or a queen behind the scenes, and you will move the, 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 the levers of power, and you will decide who gets briefed on what pieces of information, or you don't brief certain pieces of information. Let me give you an example. So I worked a, an issue that I, I can't talk a ton about, but an Asia-related concern. And what we were briefing the White House was that what we as the CIA were doing in terms of our covert action operations were incredibly successful. But I actually knew that that wasn't true. So I sat down with the analysts and I said, help me understand why uh, you all make this judgment. They're like, well, we don't make that judgment. We don't believe that's true. So I, I collated all this information and I presented it to our, what we call the seventh floor. And I said, you know, sirs, what we are presenting to the White House uh, as effective isn't. And they said, well, you know, the song and dancing. And then they said, look, why don't you breathe that downtown, right? Knowing that I had absolutely no ability to do that, right? <laughs> so they just sort of uh, it took an issue 
that they knew would be problematic for the agency, for themselves. Uh, they lied about it to the NSC and to the White House, and they decided what was best for America's foreign policy as it relates to that particular country and that particular issue around weapons of mass destruction. So it's, it's, a, one, it's a tiny little example of how the deep state can decide what a nation should or shouldn't do. The, 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 the rubric that I think has been crossed, that's, that kind of stuff is more typical Washington. What hasn't happened, in, in, certainly in my lifetime or my recollection, is a guy like Brennan and Clapper deciding that a politician or someone running this one, President Trump in this case, candidate Trump in this case, was not good enough to assume the presidency. So they were doing things to kneecap his administration before, or I should say his election, his ability to become an elected uh, official. Yeah, can you, can you explain a little bit yeah. about what these guys were doing? So let's just start with the so, dossier. Yeah. All right, because to me, you've had you've had tweets deleted over this. I mean, Twitter yeah. tried to tried to boot you and ban you because you started as a, a former CIA guy. Right. You started talking about what what Brennan was up to, what they what these guys were doing, and they they were going to boot you off Twitter. And then right. eventually, there was enough of an outcry. I tried to help as yeah. much as I could and you did, to, to you. get you back on there. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, if, if we just look at the dossier, we knew for a considerable amount of time that this information was unvetted and uncorroborated. It was, it was internet rumor, I think, is what was in the IG report, right? So it was well known that this was garbage. But yet it was utilized by the FBI to continue surveillance of a Trump campaign official. So this is before the election. Right. This right. dossier, which is basically an internet rumor, right. is now used so the CIA can use spying techniques. But let, me, let me just tell yeah. you how absolutely I'm just trying, crazy I'm just trying this to dumb was. It down. Yeah. Yeah. We had a foreign spy that was hired by a domestic political opponent inject this garbage into the system, which if you work in the intelligence field, you know that any Russian sources are oftentimes controlled by Vladimir Putin, the SVR, right? So unless you really Even vet the information- they're smart enough to have double agents? Oh, amazing, Jesus. isn't it? He's Russian. So we're, we're pumping this fake garbage that we haven't vetted into the political system. We're using it for surveillance uh, purposes. And now, and here's the kicker, in early January of 2017, they, Clapper and Comey and Brennan, leaked this dossier to the press, which had already been circulated out there, but giving it their stamp of, we know it exists, and we're gonna brief this, right? So we, they briefed it uh, to President-elect Trump, and the very act of doing that and saying, hey, you should be aware that this exists, suddenly gave the hook for the press to run with this story that we have a Russian agent sitting in the White House, the FBI and the CIA, you know, they believed enough in this document to brief it, and then, of course, the fire was set. Right? The brush fire took off. Yeah. The hysteria was launched. But what's amazing is the next number of days and the next couple of weeks, every one of those bastards, Comey and Clapper, Brennan, all of them said, oh, but you know, the dossier, we don't believe it. Like it's, it's, just, it's just rumors. Well, then why'd you brief it? it, it why'd you, why the, you it, spread it around Washington? Because you knew that it would cause a brush fire. You knew it would set this nation on fire, and you knew that the Trump presidency would likely never recover from it. And in fact, John Brennan told a crowd here in Los Angeles that President Trump would no longer be in office, as an interview he gave, uh, in, uh, by the end of 2018. He told a bunch of these Hollywood elites, don't worry about it, Trump's gonna be gone by the end of 2018. Thank God John Brennan was gone, and now he's under criminal investigation <laughs> okay. by A.G. Barr. So that was my next question. Just so how, 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 <laughs> How nervous should Clapper and Brennan and Comey be? I mean, Clapper is the guy who lied under oath when they asked him about, uh, are we you know, doing mass surveillance on people, or on our own citizens? And what was it, not wittingly, right, that he right. said, as he was scratching the top of his head, which you ever see that episode of Seinfeld? You know, when you're lying, the, the higher up on yes. your face that you scratch right. tells you if it's a big yeah. lie or not. I mean, he's literally going, not wittingly. Right, right, yeah, and oddly um, enough, his nose starts growing. Yeah, yeah but, then, but, then, yeah. but then becomes like a, a CNN analyst on this and, and suffers no right. Ramifications for lying under right. oath. Right. How, how much trouble do you think these guys really are I think in? they're in a lot, and I think that they know it. And I am, as, a, as an American, forget my party affiliation, forget uh, you know, having worked at the CIA, although that's a part of my anger because I know what they've done to the intelligence community. They have now made the American people reasonably concerned about a degree of politicization that they weren't aware of mm -hmm. or that they thought would be, might, uh, be impossible. So they have really sullied not only the reputation, but the ability of the FBI and the CIA to go out and do the good work that they need to do. We, we do, in fact, need an FBI and a CIA to do the good work that they do. But 
it's reasonable for an American to step back and say, maybe we, we shouldn't have these guys because they're so <clears throat> highly politicized. So I think that Brennan and Comey and Clapper and that whole cabal that was involved in these shenanigans in 2016 should be very worried. John Durham, a very, very smart man, and I think A.G. Barr is playing a long game on this one. I think he's letting Comey go on some of the smaller stuff. I mean, he's hitting him hard uh, in some areas, and the IG has called him a, you know, a dangerous man, a man who's had a dangerous precedent for the 30-plus thousand former and current FBI employees. And I think you're going to find the same thing uh, with, with, with uh, Clapper and, and Brennan, which so, is all over. So if these guys did so much bad stuff, what do you make of the fact that they don't shut up? Like, what do you make of the fact that Comey wrote the book, yeah. you know, which nobody bought the book, but ethics. they push the hell Comey out. teaches ethics. What is happening yeah, in this or, world? Or look at Brennan's Twitter feed. It's yeah. just like, wait a minute, you were the yes. head of the CIA. I don't think you should be, like, you're basically attacking one of the institutions, the office of the presidency. Now, I get it, Trump attacks everybody too, so sure. there, there's nobody that's totally clean here. But like, I, you know, you look at Brennan's Twitter feed and it's like, what, what are you doing? What, but they don't, I guess they feel that they'll never be caught. Well, here's, here's I think what's happening. You, you have Comey, Clem, and, uh, Clapper, and Brennan, they're all you know, contributors, they go to these fancy you know, functions, and they, they, here in Los Angeles, they, they belong to these institutes, uh, they go on Twitter, and they're all echoing the same talking points, which is, Basically, uh, Trump is a Russian traitor, or he, he's all but, and we have to get this guy out of the office uh, of, of the presidency. And we, as former CIA, FBI, ODNI, you know, whatever three or four letter you know, agency they were part of, we are the defenders of the country. We are mm -hmm. the defenders. Of the, of the nation, and so, so that's literally what you were saying about the right, state before, right? Yeah. So, so they are they are spinning this over and over and over again to continue this high boil of hysteria, so that people believe that the Brennans and the Comeys and the Clappers are actually right. good guys, right? They're they're creating their hysterical base, so that when H. E. Barr and Durham come out with this report, mark my words. That you will have the MSNBCs and the Rachel Maddows from the top of the roof screening. Well, oh, but it's partisan and it's not true, and this is just a part. This is a witch hunt against them, and they, they will deny facts. So it's coming. So they, they are they are preparing the battlefield very, very wisely, although horrifically. <laughs> they're they're trying to save their own skin, uh, and so that's they're, they're prepping the battlefield with all of these hysterical tweets, so that they can find a way, at least in the public sphere, to to, to push back to save their skin. All right. So I want to get to the media portion of that because uh, you've talked a lot about how they leak things to the media and the rest mm -hmm. of that. But before we get to that, how pissed are these guys at the at Mueller? for the report. I mean, they, they obviously didn't think this was going to be the outcome and it was all going to just be nonsense and right. make Rachel Maddow right. look like a complete raving right. lunatic. Right. So, so no collusion. That was a surprise for the Democratic Party, wasn't it, for the left? The, that was a slam dunk, right? That was supposed to be a very clear case of a president being um, you know, a Russian agent, and he wasn't. It, look, it was appropriate. Did, did it all yeah. seem like nonsense? Like what I kept saying from the beginning was, if if this is all true, wouldn't every Democrat be saying we're in World War III now? Yeah. Like let's really take this thing to its end conclusion. If it's really true that in effect, Russia basically installed the president of the United States, I mean that's a, as big a crime as you could possibly get. So congratulations, yep. we're we're in World War III. Right. They're worried about the new World War III, but right. we're in it already. So I think that many of us, to include myself at the very beginning, were concerned about the connections, uh, not just the dossier-related garbage, because that was silly, but some of the rest of it. And it was like, my position, I think a lot of us at the very beginning said, look, let Bob Mueller do a fair job within a short period of time to address this issue. Because what I knew working in the intelligence community is if we had any information, any intelligence, sagant or human, in other words, phone calls, emails, if we had any kind of sources from human beings, multiple individuals throughout the world in Moscow, etc., who could all corroborate the same thing, then we, we need to know that and let's put that forward. But very quickly that information should be brought to the table and, and we would be ejecting the man from the White House uh, within the first few months of his presidency. And when that didn't happen, it became very clear to me, and I think most reasonable intelligence officials, or former officials, that there was nothing there. That this was now getting into a political exercise. Mm -hmm. And I think that the report showed that, that there certainly was no collusion. Uh, now, the, the, the issue of did he try to obstruct, well, boy, I think you can take a step back and say, look, if I were a newly elected president, and I knew that I was being smeared by a bunch of former FBI and CIA people in the media saying I was a Russian agent, I know that's not true. Damn right I'm gonna try to shut down that investigation because mm -hmm. I know it's garbage. 
Most reasonable people would want to say, forget it, that's garbage, and I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to politicize my ability to do this work as President of the United States. You were trying to make sure that I can't do what the American people elected me to do. Especially, literally, you were elected on draining the swamp. Correct. So that's sort of the, the core right. thing here. So the, the obstruction piece, I think, is, is a political loser. I also think that the, the essence of the argument is garbage as well. But the Democratic Party has clung to that, and uh, now that they see that that wasn't working out, and Bob Mueller, bless his heart, if you recall when he uh, testified that he Poor just, guy. I, I yeah, mean, actually it felt, was sad. I actually felt bad for him. Like yeah. he was just way over his head or he, or he has a little bit of the Biden sort of like, are you even all there right. kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, a good man, uh, he, he, I think he, he worked hard for his country, but he was way over his skis doing something he shouldn't have. He should have stayed in, in uh, uh, retirement land. So. All right, so the other piece of this, which we've, you've sort of been hitting on here, is, is the media portion and how all of these leaks, every day you open up the New York Times or CNN or MSNBC, and they're reporting on stuff that's supposed to be behind closed doors, there are secret congressional meetings about things, but somehow MSNBC and the New York Times has all of Schiff's talking points right, right. and the rest of it. How does this game actually get played? Like, is it, is it as obviously ridiculous as, and, so, and just so blatant as it seems? Could it be that blatant? Yeah, it, it is. Look, um, most of the leaking, so the, the, when you work in Washington, you find out very quickly that most of the leaking occurs either by the White House, interestingly enough, or by the senior levels of the various departments and agencies. It's, it's rarely that lower or, or working level individual, right? It's the people who, again, like Aldrich Ames, have decided that they know what's best for the country, so they're going to act on it. And they're going to leak things to try to push uh, the, the media narrative in one direction or another based on whatever they, they want, mm -hmm. right? whatever their goals are, their personal goals. We saw that with Comey. I mean, we know he leaked to the New York Times via a cutout to try to push for an independent counsel, and he got it. So it's not as though this, the tactic doesn't work. It does work. So that's frightening. That should frighten all of yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, both sides do it, but what we have seen over the past three years is a group of individuals from the FBI, from the CIA, who are leaking pieces of information to kneecap a duly elected president so that they can put the people in power that they choose, irrespective of party, whether it's a never Trumper or whether it's a, one of these, you know, more traditional moderate Democrat, what the hell that means these days. Right. right? Well, it's not really irrespective of party, right? Because it's you mean a never Trumper or some other Democrat. Sure. sure. But, yeah, but yeah. I mean, historically, <laughs> it, the leaks have, have come from both yeah. sides of the aisle to, to the media because of their own personal personal desire to sure. shape policy, right? We're just seeing it on steroids now. Yeah. The amount of leaking, the, the, the ferociousness of the impact of those leaks, right? That it, It's not just we like this or we don't like this. It's, you know, Trump is a, is a traitor or it's gonna launch us in World War III or it, it's that absurdity, it's that hysteria that, that was kicked off in 2016 and hasn't stopped. Do you think that's partly just because we're just watching institutions crumble across the board and so they're all sort of in their death throes so you just throw out everything? So, you know what I mean? Like, we're watching our media institutions crumble, our political institutions are crumbling, we're exposing information, conversations like this weren't really being had five years ago. So as it all becomes more obvious, the ways it can lash out become crazier. So as, as the curtain is pulled back on the Wizard of Oz, does he not get a little bit more panicked about people <laughs> understanding he's like four foot two, yeah. you know, 250 pounds? Yeah. Um, I think that that could explain a lot because, again, at some level, when you start looking at, for instance, let's just take the media, right? So it's long been known that the media focuses on one particular party and benefiting that, and it's a Democratic Party, which, by the way, when you get like 95% of your political funds or, or that, that is the media supports you, like from their political de donations, it's incredible that the Republican Party even exists. Yeah. Right? <laughs> when you have that degree of, of an avalanche of support in your nation's media, the fact that another party exists is really incredible. Or it means a Democrat. Reminder, stupid. I'm looking at a lifelong Democrat. I right, just want right. to say that again. So the, look, in the last 10 to 15 years, forget that, five years. Yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, his, we're, his we're going to get, get there. But yeah, no, I think you're right to say that the media is recognizing that, that we're all pulling off the mask and seeing who they are. And that is horrifying to them because the moment that we start questioning their authority to tell us what's right and wrong, and we start to say, you know what, actually, you've given to the, the other political party, you used to work for that other you know, organization or entity that is now against Trump, or like, we now know that you're biased, and that's fine, right? You, you and I both have an opinion. We, sure. we, we both go on TV and talk about things and our opinions. That's fine. But let's be candid about who we are and what we believe in, and let's not pass it as news, because it's not news. It's just an opinion, right? It's interesting. Uh, the former uh, editor of the New York Times uh, gave this fantastic interview where she talked about her students. You know, she left the New York Times now. I believe it's at Yale or, or one of these uh, fancy Ivies. 
and she works with students who want to become journalists. And she said one of the frustrations that she has is that they all want to report on their own opinions of what's happening in the world, right, and, and not the news. And it's like, well, amen. We have been walking down this road for 15 plus years where everybody in the Right, in the why not admit and, it? <laughs> yeah. So, so let's have an honest conversation that the Walter Cronkites are gone. Yeah. And it's and it's now, you know, a circus and it's we, everybody's got a different performer that they prefer and that's bad and we should acknowledge that that's bad and we should I think as a country and at some point, you know, at, when does journalism ring its own bell and say we, we've gone too far. Let's see if we can do something different. So when you read the paper that was formerly the New York Times, are there phrases that you can see are obvious tells when it's complete nonsense? Beyond just unnamed source or source you on mean, Capitol Hill. You mean other than just picking it up uh, and yeah. it's saying New York Times <laughs> just, and then putting it back down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by the way, as I always say, every time I, I knock the New York Times, I would prefer this not be the case. Amen. Everyone, Look, everyone does it. The people that I find that are railing against it the most yeah. are the people that don't want this to be the most. You so, know what I mean? So like, the irony, just so, don't be totally horrible. I, I come from the middle of nowhere in eastern rural Oregon. The, the way that I was able to get into the CIA was that I went to the Washington Post and the New York Times and I read it every single day back in the late 90s and early 2000s. I took notes on each story. I built you know, my knowledge and understanding of the world based on their reporting. So there was a time when I was a big fan and I appreciated what they, they were doing for, for me, for the, for the world, for the country, spreading you know, what was actually happening. And, and we've lost that <clears> at, at the Great Lady. And, and the Washington Post has gone even more bananas and bonkers. It, it's horrible for the republic because democracies need that voice to challenge people in power. Uh, and so, so do you think we're more than anything else, I mean, putting all the political stuff aside, putting, yeah. putting deep state aside, putting the parties aside, that we're really more in an information war at this point than anything else? Or, it's not even information, it's really the delivery system of the information more sure. than anything else. I mean, you're talking to a guy who put out two tweets, expressed a, a simple political opinion, no inflammatory can no you language. Just, can you just remind me what the tweets were exactly? Yeah. Because it's kind of, you're a former CIA ops guy, I think you've Prove it here in these, this half hour, whatever it is, that you know what you're talking about. And here are the, the, the two tweets that you put up. So, so both of them basically had to do with uh, President Trump or Democrats being crazy. And one was taking a headline from the Washington Post, which was silly Parson Flim Flam. Didn't remember what the hell the, 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 the headline was. I was just commenting on the fact that it was silly. And that was enough. Uh, to, to, to get me banned for whatever number of days, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the other was a thread talking uh, about uh, the president uh, and you know what we are, are this whole impeachment silliness and how absurd it is. And, and it was a relatively short thread, and it was banned. Um, again, simply taking a, a yeah. snippet from the IG report and commenting on that section of the report that was enough. So that to me, and I know that you you have been banging this drum for a long time. <laughs> is incredibly frightening that we now have a, a handful of, of entities from Silicon Valley that are really publishers deciding who gets to say whatever they want them to say. And if it goes too far, either as a corporate policy or as a you know, one-off, whatever number of, of employees decide that's bad, they're gonna throw a little sand in the gears, right? They may not ban you completely, they may, but they may just throw some sand in the gears and have you blocked for a week or two or whatever when, it, when you want to share something at a very important time of the nation's politics, right? During this Iran you know, issue, right? So we're gonna throw some sand in your gears, we're gonna stop you from tweeting, or stop you from sharing something on Facebook. That's what they're doing now, that's what they've done to me. Does it feel like the whole game is designed to just make us crazier? Right now, like that every time <laughs> well, you, that's, you that's read any, result. like once you start seeing this stuff, yeah. right? You, you have your little red pill moment, you start seeing this stuff, you don't wanna see it, right? Yeah. You wanna put, uh, the ocean back in the cup, right? and it just doesn't fit. Well, I think that this has been a long time coming. So what's interesting is uh, uh, in the, MIT did this brilliant study um, that in the late 90s when some of our economic trade policies were changing, China went to the WTO, uh, we had Mexico and, and Canada and NAFTA, and a lot of the communities that were being impacted negatively uh, by these economic changes were starting to elect people to, to Congress and, and, and Senate uh, who were increasingly more inflammatory, increasingly further on the left and further on the right. And, and what you now see, that, that created a marketplace for people in media to, to be even more loud and bombastic and crazy because people were angry and so they were able to tap into that marketplace, right? So I think that, that the things that you're seeing in America's media right now are really reflective of a country that's deeply unsettled. 
It doesn't mean that we don't celebrate the progress here in this country because economically, I don't think you can make an argument, and you've had people in this program that made it very clear that we are benefiting profoundly from our wonderful economic system, imperfect as it is, our yeah. wonderful republic, imperfect as it is, but there's clearly a sickness that is being reflected in our media that is really, at the end of the day, it, it reflects our own brokenness, our own anger, because we're, so, we're responding in such a visceral way, we're giving those people ratings. All right, so let's go to our woe is me beat up lefty guys here for a second, <laughs> because yeah. as you're saying that, I'm reminded of when I used to be on the Young Turks and I was a big lefty, yeah. uh, that I'd be on air with the host and they'd be screaming like yeah. crazy people about something. There's no, there's no video of me ever screaming about anything like this, but they'd be screaming at something and then we'd cut to break and then they'd be completely fine again, like completely fine. Then we'd come back and people are screaming right, again, or right. crying or yelling right, or pounding right, their right. fists. Right. And I remember thinking like, this is just all theater to yeah. me. Like this is not theater to me. I'm ha we're having the same exact conversation right now that we were having before the cameras started Correct. and everything else, but we've been sort of primed that everything is, is sort of theater right now. Uh, but it doesn't seem like we can we can get any of this back. Like, is that is that now where we're at? Like, that it, it won't come back. So when I'm talking about with the cup and the ocean, it's like yeah. we now need different institutions. I think there's a lot of people trying to hang on to the old institutions. I see this with a lot of my last remaining sane lefty friends. Like, they really want the new the New York Times will come back, right. the Democratic Party will come back, but they ain't coming back, guys. If if there's any hope, it's. President Trump wins in 2020, uh, and the Democratic Party. And the Party, death blow is so right. cataclysmic. It, it would have to be an overwhelming loss, both the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Um, you know, we, we would be talking about like a 1984 election with Mondale, an 88 election with Dukakis. But, you know, let's not forget that, that stupid tends to be very resilient. Uh, and so you're seeing a lot of that coming out of places like New York with Ocasio-Cortez. We're getting a lot of very crazy individuals who are very now powerful within the Democratic Party, absolutely reshaping it. You would need to have a progressive nominated uh, for the 2020 uh, election lose against uh, uh, President Trump. So they have to have their Corbyn, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I see that as, I mean, how crazy, though, for, for two guys that are basically lifelong Democrats. Right. And I can't call myself part of the left anymore. Yeah. But I'm hanging but, on by like, like my fingernails. Yeah, no, but I, a lot of my good last liberal friends are trying. Like, I get it, and it's just like, yeah. for me, the ship has sailed, it's fine. Um, but you wrote a piece in Drop Fox off News. off a life raft for those of us here paddling behind you. I, I'm going to keep the life raft out there, but not much longer. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got to go now. I, I've been Make saying the jump. Yeah, yeah. Well, I feel like I've been screaming about this for so long that now it's weird because you know how your frustrations change over time. And yeah. it's like, I used to be really frustrated with the right. And, and then for these last couple of years, I've been frustrated with the left. Now I'm like really frustrated at my last remaining lefty friends that just refuse to see reality. Because right. it's like, come on, guys. Like, how much, how much more destruction do you want these people to sow? There, how much further down the socialist path do you want to go? But, the, but you wrote a piece about this in, in Fox News. Right. I mean, do you think there's any chance? Like, who, who are the remaining Democrats that would make someone like you say you're a Democrat? Or the, or the forget the people, although yeah. you're welcome to tell me some. What are the Democratic policies that actually make any sense anymore? So if you look at, if you believe Gallup polling, so about 15% of Democrats are conservative Democrats, or identify as conservative Democrats, 35 say they're moderate, and 50% say liberal progressive. So there is clearly a split within the party. I think what you're seeing now um, in places like Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina and Nevada, some of that polling, <clears throat> Biden's still got the poll position. Um, but clearly, if you look at Bernie Sanders uh, and to somewhat lesser extent, Elizabeth Warren, that wing of the party is strong. Uh, and so what happens in this primary season, I think will set the temperature and the direction for the party for many, many years to come. And that's why you're seeing people like Ocasio-Cortez just yesterday say in an interview that she can't believe that she and Biden are both part of the same party. Well, because that was the plan she, all along. She's not a Democrat. Bernie Sanders isn't a Democrat. They're Democratic Socialists, which of course, as you have, they're going to drop the Democratic yeah. Party at some the, point, right? The D word's going Although, down yeah. North Korea has called themselves the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Right. So it, there is a branding <laughs> exercise there, right? <laughs> it's it's pure branding, okay. So, uh, it, it, it's, it really, there's, sort of, there's some chutzpah happening right now within yeah. the, 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 the socially, uh, socialist wing of the party, uh, basically saying that they are the party. So that fight's going to continue to 2020. Let's see what happens. My personal uh, hope, and I, and I hate to say this, but my personal hope is that, that we elect some crazy progressive, elect Bernie Sanders, right? Then the American people have a very clear distinction mm -hmm. of, of with, for whom they should choose. What should the future of the country look like? 
Is it the Bernie Sanders and, and, the, and the Green New Deals and the free, you know, everything that nobody can pay for, right? And, and it's absurd. Plus all the racism and the well, intersectional yes, stuff I, and yes, the rest of that. Yes, the Diversity yeah, Olympic yeah, stuff, okay. and all, yeah. So uh, is that who we want to become? And if it's not, then you have to vote for the other guy because you only have two choices. But do you think there's any mechanism, I and mean, this is the thought that I've really been stuck on for the last couple of months, like is there any mechanism that liberals have, I mean good liberals, right? So like an old school Democrat has to fight off the bad thing because we're just watching all of them be pinned one at a time. You know what I mean? Like Biden yeah. was brought in to be the, the straight shooter and the decent right. guy and the old school Democrat. Now he's telling you you can pick which prison you want to go to yeah. depending and, on what gender how you to identify code, as. Coal miners. And he literally, I mean, yeah. Not a, learn how to code coal miners, and then and then his other thing the other day about so um, much for Western PA Joe, yeah. yeah. But but oh oh I thought you were gonna say because he had this other thing the other day about um you know we, we're uh, basically he said we're a European culture, not a, some culture that's been imported from right. Africa, and it's like um, I thought that's what <laughs> isn't that what. <laughs> But he was brought in to be the, and that's what I'm saying, like there's no mechanism for a decent Democrat anymore. Right, there's right. no vehicle for right. it anymore. Right. No, there's not, right? Because uh, at some level you would hope that the media or, or people within uh, you know, the, the Washington Post, New York Times, and, and the CNNs and the MSNBCs, that they would have some of the more sensible voices and calling out the people like Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders saying, they're not real Democrats. Let's talk about their strategy document from 2012 that talks about Marx and Lenin and, and taking over the economy. Like, let's talk about who they are yeah. versus the Joey Behar's, the view of like, she's super awesome, yeah. you know, and, and Rachel Maddow of like, boy, she's an impressive gal. Yeah. Like, what is happening? Like, I don't care that she can dance really, fun on a roof in Boston, like that stupid viral video, like yeah. that's not important. The fact that she wants to encourage the United States government to take over the means of production in this, in this country, the socialism, would you say? yeah, right, let's, let's up in that and, and let's pass the new Green Deal, which we could never afford, and oh, by the way, isn't actually going to be effective. Right? So let's slaughter all the cows because of the cow farts. Okay, super. You are aware that China and India, their combined CO2 and methane emissions will, would far and do far eclipse everything that the United States and European Union could ever do in terms of, of their horrific pollution. So you can kill the cows you want, but until you address the India and China problem, this is silly. This is a silly conversation. And the only reasonable people in this conversation right now, shockingly enough, are Republicans. It's the Dan Crenshaws who are like, yeah, look, CO2 and methane, it's, a, it's real, like yeah. it's happening, and we need to focus on R&D related issues that scrub the stuff out of the environment, and we, that's what we need to be doing, versus knocking down every, every house and rebuilding it, killing all the farting cows. Like, if you're gonna kill farting people, you know, kill, what about Swalwell? Yeah. I mean, he goes on TV and farts, like what about that guy, you know? Yeah, that was the biggest fart of 2019. That was, that was an amazing series of flatulence. Yeah, yeah it was, so, it was so a lift, actually, he lifted. He, right, he actually yeah, got it, was up, a but no, no, he said it, they said it was a cup. That right. Right, Matthews right, moved no. his cup on, sure. the, on the table. Sure. Um, That's, I use that excuse too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, all right. If they go down that road and then, okay, now Bernie, let's just say it's Bernie, right? Because yeah. that's the easier answer here. Bernie ends up getting crushed. And then we have round two of Trump. You think there's a chance they actually recalibrate and, and look in the mirror and do it? Because they've had, I mean, Trump's president now, like at, right. at every moment, and this is where, where my frustration lies, where there have been every moment when those roadblocks have come of like, guys, let's take the look, yeah. they always just plow right through. And I sense that that's exactly what they're gonna do. I, I sense that's what they're gonna do in, uh, in the UK now. Like it just, it doesn't stop. It so doesn't the, stop. The question is, are we at the point uh, where, where leftism is so broken that we double down? So we, 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 ha we have our Mondale moment and we're just gonna go with Dukakis? Or are we at the Bill Clinton 92 moment where the, the, the powers that be in the Democratic Party say, okay, we, we dipped our toes in the crazy <laughs> right. waters. It was fun. Let's, let's do something different now. Um, and I, I think that we are more at our 84 moment. And I think that we're going to double down on stupid because I think that the fever is too strong. Look, Tom Perez, the DNC, said that Ocasio-Cortez is the future of the party. Barack Obama endorsed her uh, during her election. Uh, you know, he's now endorsed Medicare for all. I mean, this is a man who at the same time also talks about, you know, we need to not go too far to the left. Well, then why the holy hell are you endorsing socialists? He, like, he plays it both sides. Every, every other week precisely. he comes out with something that sounds, you know, oh, we shouldn't judge people by the right. color of their skin. And then <laughs> women right. should rule the world. Right. And it's right. like, come on, man, right. pick, pick a side. Right? So the, it, we are in the middle of silly season. And, it, and it's not just the, the, 
Why, why is this important, right? So this conversation about where is, is the left today, why, why should we really care? The people who are watching this who are Republicans or Libertarians and they're like, yeah, screw you, yeah, asshole. Go. Why well, they keep emailing me and they, they keep saying, Dave, stop giving them the hints. Right, right. You know. But here's what I would say to them. And this is what I would say to any of us who are tired of the left uh, you know, silliness, but well, we'll just all vote for Trump. Right? We are not China with one party. We are not North Korea with one dear leader. A republic, a true democracy requires vibrant parties to combat each other, to fight with each other rhetorically, to provide different solutions to problems. Right? So you need a vibrant political class to have these conversations because at the end of the day, this is so important because who else is going to lead humanity for the next number of years, for the next century? It's not going to be China. It's not going to be Russia, and God forbid if either of those two nations are leading humanity. So is that the irony here that when, when people want us to pull out of everything, and I get that my libertarian side really yeah. feels that, and why are we giving all these countries money? Yeah. And if you told me right now we were going to cut foreign aid 25% across the board, I'd probably be for it. I don't know all of the ramifications of all of those things, and I'm sure that would... You can uh, talk about foreign aid, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, right, so, so, all right, so well, let's talk about it then. But like, So like that part of me really exists, but then it's like, it's not just that we'd pull back and... It, and then things would just keep operating. It's like, well, somebody's gonna step in. Correct. And who do we want to step in? So as imperfect as we are, I kinda would rather it be us. It's just our sort of uh, Faustian bargain with the universe or something. Well, so look, from a foreign policy perspective, you know, people talk about what's our strategy, what's our strategy? Well, we wanna create more democracies. And then we want to try to stop or slow down or bog down the parties uh, who would stop us, humanity, from reaching that point of greater liberty. Right? Because that is ultimately the goal. And we are the, the, the torchbearers of that legacy. It when is when our you say that, so, you, you hit on this earlier, but when you say that, the idea that we're giving them more liberty and we want more democracies, because democracies don't get into wars with right. each other. It's not purely like, I think when people say that, you want to spread democracy, there's somehow it means this sort of financial right. thing or capitalist thing. Right. But it actually is, I mean, this is, I don't know if you read Virtue and Nationalism mm. by Jerome Harzoni. It's like strong nations actually, mm. strong democratic nations, that's what actually brings peace. Correct, absolutely. And, and this has been, again, Foreign Policy 101, this has been a, a, a profound goal of most United States presidents and their administrations. So yes, we have to be involved and engaged in different parts of the world where it suits our interests, uh, particularly whether it be economic and so forth. And again, this is the Trump, it's like, what are we getting? Give us your oil stuff, right? He's using crass language, but, but the request is fair. But in places where China or Russia or, uh, that don't represent uh, the, the future of humanity in the way that I think you and I would want all of us to be. Like they're, they're underwriting you know, corrupt regimes all over the world, uh, certainly China, definitely in places like Africa. Um, what can we do to slow down their reach and their power? Because that, that is important without committing a ton of our resources, our people and our treasure to that, right? And then it becomes sort of a strategic engagement or withdrawal from different parts of the world because oftentimes this aid, really at the end of the day, we're just we're, we're paying people off to keep the, the, you know, the, the Russians out, the Chinese out, we're to try to keep it a low boil, but not encouraging corruption, right? So that can be a, a very difficult thing to balance, but I <laughs> right. will you're tell you. You're probably gonna get a lot of corruption just as a result get, of it, but. Correct, so, yeah. so you have to constantly keep a pulse on that, right? So it's, it's not, it's not easy to do this, but I will tell you, I've seen these aid projects in places like, uh, say, in Zambia, where we're, we're giving them all this money. For instance, where some of the tribes, well, we're giving them uh, lots of money to build fish ponds, and yet you've got the world, you know, these other NGOs coming in and delivering food, and so all the fish die and the, and the, and the ponds go dry. But it's like, well, of course, because you're just you're giving people food. They're not going to schlep out in this <laughs> terrible heat and like work. Of course, they're not. So we, sometimes we, are, uh, we do things that are silly with our aid. But the, the broader point, the most important thing that we have to remember from a foreign policy perspective is we're trying to create more democracies. That's gonna be a long, ugly process. It is not gonna happen by the barrel of a gun and it's not gonna happen to tomorrow. So let's have some patience. And then where we are engaged in the world, especially when it comes to our military, damn right there better be something that the American people are getting in return because it can't be this constant outlay. And that's what I think you're seeing guys like Tucker Carlson and others be, be you know, very reluctant about our continued engagement in the Middle East. So change your energy policy, make them irrelevant, and now you can march forward. You know, it's interesting that you bring up Tucker there because 
you know, I see this sort of split now where Trump, you know, did the uh, the strike in Iran and now suddenly Tucker said, well, this is going to lead us to World War III. Trump's kind of just like everybody else. Yeah. And I like Tucker very much, obviously. But I thought while everyone's sort of jumping all over that, like, ah, see this horrible split that's occurred and oh my God. Right. To me, it's like, this is great. Right. This is what a great debate is happening on the right right now. Right. You know, can you do a strike? Does that lead to World right. War III? Like, what a beautiful thing. It's like, where would that happen on the left these days without someone being just completely slaughtered in the in the crossfire. Well, well, let's talk about what the Democratic Party's done in the last three or six months about these, so in terms of foreign engagement. Like, so Trump wants to withdraw from Syria, and you know, he's an idiot, right? Remember that yeah, conversation? Yeah, yeah. And now he's sending people into Iraq, and well, now he's an idiot. Well, what is it? What do you guys want? What is your strategy on the left? I mean, I would love to hear that. I mean, we know what Joe Biden likes to do with, in terms of some of his foreign policy stuff. He, he's been wrong more times than he's been right. And then he sends his kid and, and blesses his engagement with the corrupt Ukrainian oligarch and takes it. Oh, let's let's fin- let, can, can we just finish with that? Actually, that's the right way to finish. I meant to get it, to it before when we did the Russia stuff. So the Ukraine stuff and 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 impeachment and everything else is the basic takeaway here. Beyond the obvious stuff that everyone sees on the headlines, like how insane it was that Hunter Biden's getting, what was it, 50 grand a month? Was sure, it, was whatever 60, the amount is, it's absurd. Grand a month. Something, something insane. To, to work for an energy company he had no expertise right. in, blah, blah, blah. His dad happened to be vice president, right. okay. That what it, it seems that this all hinges on the idea that if Trump felt legitimately that there was corruption, which there clearly was, like nobody's really debating whether right. something seriously corrupt was going right. on there. Jake Tapper's admitted this on his program, love it. Jake is like 50-50. It's like <laughs> one day I'm like, Jake, you get it, the next day he yeah. just does it yeah, again. Yeah, it's it's CNN, yeah. it, it's, it's a mind virus. Um, but it, it seems that it all hinges on the idea that if Trump genuinely believed that there was corruption, and I think every sane person believes that there was corruption, Correct. then he had the he had the uh, his authorization the obligation. Right, or the obligation absolutely to to actually do something about it. Is that is that did I get this thing kind of right? Yes, right. And if you look at polling, even if, I think it's some forty some odd percent of Democrats actually think that what the Bidens did was wrong and deserves a degree of scrutiny. So. You've got a good chunk of the party, darn near half, that think that. And, of course, independents and Republicans are fully on board with that. So that's the fundamental problem with this impeachment push, is if the president, if there was nothing there, if the Bidens did absolutely nothing wrong, then, of course, Trump would have been absolutely horrifically wrong to ask them to get involved in our politics or, or try to kneecap Biden or any other person. But that's not the case. We know unquestionably, just based on what we know from press reports, yeah. And from, uh, we now have testimony by an Obama uh, administration diplomat, that as early as 2015, they were raising the flag in Kiev saying, hey, look, what the Biden kid's doing is undercutting our ability to fight corruption in Ukraine. And they were told to you know, basically shut the hell up. What, what about that incredible video of Biden just admitting the whole thing? Well, I, it's, it's, why all, does it it's, all, <laughs> it's all a scam, right? It's all a joke. It's all a scam. And this is when I want to like, I'm, They're like, it's channel, so ridiculous. Let's just put it out there. Yeah, this is when I want oh, I, like, I to channel my inner Trump and then be like, it's a witch hunt. It's all scam. Yeah, because it is. It's silly. The, the Bidens did things that were inappropriate and wrong, and they should have been investigated, whether it be by the Ukrainians, whether it be our, by our Department of Justice or both. It's absolutely enough is there for us to say that was wrong and it should be investigated. Yeah. And the fact that the president's being called on the carpet for this and impeached over his demand to look into it, I think is absurd. Put it in a committee, investigate it at the end of the day, but to actually launch an impeachment and put this country through something that, that is just silly, it's, it's, it's absolutely horrifically wrong of the Democratic Party and shame on Pelosi and Schumer and the legacy of the past five, 10 years for what has happened under the progressive leadership. I think you are going to look back and say, what, is, what a sorrowful time for this country. Well, congratulations, because for as a Democrat that thinks Trump that has, has to be reelected to get this thing to reset, I'm pretty sure if you ever wanted to fire up the Trump base, you just did it with a partisan impeachment. But what do you make of now the fact that they're not even sending this to the Senate? So they do a completely partisan right. impeachment, right? Completely Trump, partisan. Trump is not a, a Nazi guy, right? I mean, he's Hitler. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So we were all living we're in, in Nazi. Hold on this. No, right. Let's we, hold on the paperwork. We, we are living in Nazi Germany, the equivalent of modern day, right? We're, we're, we're putting kids in cages and Trump is Hitler, right? But you know what? Let's sit back for a while. Let's sit back <laughs> in this impeachment stuff for just a little bit. Let's think about this for a while. Like, go, go to hell. That's just absurd. And it defies logic. It defies reason. If you're going to move forward, you better have the facts and then let the American people make the, the, the call. Have right. you heard the crazy theory that she's gonna sit on it long enough, that Pelosi will sit sure. on it long enough so that assuming Trump's get, Trump gets reelected, yeah. and then, but maybe something happens in the Senate more favorably to the Democrats, yeah. th- then you move on it then. I mean, true insanity. 
Well, if that's and the it's strategy, like, yeah, maybe. I mean, if if that's Pelosi's long game, I'll tell you what. I think she's uh, she's going to be disappointed come next November because I, in doing that, she she looks so flippin' absurd that most reasonable voters say these folks aren't serious. They're not being adults right now. You can have differences with the administration, with Trump, in terms of his temperament, in terms of some of his policies. That's fine. Make the case, but this kind of stuff, either if I may, shit or get off the pot. Right? Move the impeachment forward and move them out of office, let the Senate judge, and if they don't, tough. You've done your part, House, move on. Now make the case of the American people. I think you've proven why I consider you one of the few sane people on Twitter here, so I'm gonna tell the good people to follow you on Twitter. It's Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Dean, D-E-A-N, W-R-I-G-H-T. Thanks for coming in. We're gonna have to do this again. Can't wait. I gotta, once you move, once you officially are like, left, done, yeah. Democrat, <laughs> Hang on, hang by, hang by some nails, brother. <laughs> At Brian Dean Wright on Twitter. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you wanna watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.